Hello everyone, welcome to episode 5 of Hollywood and History, the only Sogamon Tellurian podcast you'll find anywhere on the internet. And if you don't know who Sogamon Tellurian is, well, you're in the right place. On today's show, Armin and I discuss Lord of the Rings director Peter Jackson's recent documentary where he uses a cutting-edge technology to bring World War I footage to life. And we have some footage like that, so maybe we could use that same technology and in some project coming up. Uh, also, I asked Armin if he knows what Sogamon Tellurian was doing exactly 100 years ago this week. He's got some good answers. And finally, we hear from an important person in a very important place. That's all right now on Hollywood and History. Enjoy. Hey, Armin. Hey, Michael. How's it going? Very good. Uh, looks like you're getting uh, kind of getting into the groove here. You've got uh, your something new on your head now yeah i figured this shouldn't be you know a, a two-bit operation or anything like that <laughs> well what are you saying about me i don't have headphones on <laughs> well you had one in the one of the last of the i think it's the first episode right so yeah yeah well i to be fair i do have an earbud in so i have i do have the same technically the same uh function of headphones but mine's in an earbud so all right uh i want to launch right into this but before we get on to the different things, multiple things we're going to cover today. Uh, I need to reiterate right up front, probably in every episode, that this podcast, uh, Hollywood and History, and this YouTube channel, Tales of Truth, is authorized by the Sogamon Tellurian family. Uh, it, I think that's kind of important to remind people of. We're not just kind of a, you know, hey, let's do a let's do a podcast about Sogamon Tellurian. We are doing that, but in addition to that, we are authorized by his family. So this is the only authorized place on the web where you're going to find a podcast and a YouTube channel that's authorized by the family. Um, and I'm not just saying that. Can you can vouch for that too, right, Armin? Yeah, I mean. Oops. All right. I'm going to have to edit that part out. I'm going to edit that out. Uh, so you just noticed a little edit there. So <laughs> I was getting confirmation from Armin that this is authorized by the, the Tellurian family. And he said something that shouldn't be aired. <laughs> he was confirming. Okay. There's a non-disclosure agreement. There's certain, I mean, he didn't really violate the non-disclosure agreement, but I want to be, we, we want to exercise caution uh, overly exercise caution. So, <laughs> would you like to rephrase what you what you said, Armin? Yeah, I mean, it, we are making the the authorized version of the story, and that means you know making it as accurate and authentic as possible with the authorization of the family. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to cut that part? I mean, I'm sorry. It's just I'm not sure exactly. What a, <laughs> You're fine. Yeah, so now Armin's being overly cautious. There are certain things I can't say because of a non-disclosure agreement, but we can say that the family, and by the way, the family's watching, so let's do a shout out right now. Hello. Some of the Tellurian family are watching this podcast. So, um, hi. They they uh, they uh, eagerly anticipate each episode. So, if you are a Sogamon Tellurian fan, you are watching a podcast that the Sogamon Tellurian family is also watching. There you go. Uh, and I think I'm going to put a, like a subtitle, you know, Hollywood in History, the authorized Sogamon Tellurian podcast, something like that. All right. Um, we have some sad news, Armin. Sad? Yeah. Abril Bookstore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I heard about that uh, just a couple of days ago. Was... Well, tell me, tell us about the sad news, Armin. Yeah. So, Abril Bookstore was one of, I think, the three Armenian bookstores that were in Glendale, California, of course, the, the center of um, Armenian life in Los Angeles. And I would go there from my days when I was an undergrad student just to find books or hard to find books that dealt with Armenian history or Armenian culture, almost anything you could think of. The bookstore owner 
uh, Arno and his dad uh, who started it had it. And that was like a uh, central, you know, it was like one of my old stomping grounds back home. And to hear about the, the news that it's not closing, but it, you know, they're moving to a new location. It's just uh, uh, a little sad to hear. And of course, uh, it has like importance for how you and I have met. So I went by there yesterday and I filmed, I, I filmed the spot where you, where I, where you and I first met. Uh, I know we, we talked about it in the very first episode of this Hollywood in history, but uh, here's, here's that spot. I'm standing in the very spot where I first met Armin Manuk Kaloyan. It was right here. I was sitting on a stool right here. He came in the door and walked around me. And uh, I was not wearing a mask obviously. So, uh, I was breaking the rules and, uh, <laughs> but a f a m I found out that he was struggling about a month or so ago. I, I actually went by there earlier, a couple month month and a half ago and, um, did a real, sh not an interview, but I, I got him on camera talking about the bookstore. We've been around for 42 years, specializing in Armenian books from all around the world. We're the oldest bookstore in LA, the West Coast. Um, the largest one, they even say, well, outside of Armenia, and some people say even including Armenia, you can't find a book store like this with all the Armenian books from all around the world so but so you're one of a kind yeah, yeah here's a shot of him I caught him without his mask on as I walked in so that's Arno um, and there's no other single repository of so much Armenian history in one spot anywhere on the planet and it's like a hub of activity that doesn't exist anywhere else and now he's He's relocating. Uh, he has, doesn't have another location yet. I spoke to him yesterday, but uh, the sad news is that particular location, because of COVID and everybody having to downsize, it's forcing us all to tighten our belts. And he's, I think he's looking for a smaller place. That was also a place that you and I have always gone and hung out. And there's cafes nearby. And this part of downtown Glendale is so lively. And to have that you know, that store no longer be there. It almost seems like, uh, Glen, you know, that part of Glendale is not going to be the same. So, yeah, it's a very sad thing to hear. And you know, I, I don't know, I wish him the best. Yeah. Uh, let's just say if Abril Bookstore didn't exist, I wouldn't even be working on this project. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made the connections that I made. It was in that bookstore that I, you know, I may have found the Sogmon Tellerian uh, transcript, the, uh, the court transcript. I, I probably could have found that at another Armenian bookstore, but I wouldn't have met you. Um, Arno also introduced me to, well, he gave me a book uh, by Shahan Natalie, which was one of the uh, organizers of Operation Nemesis, you know, so I got that book and then I met you and then Arno also handed me a phone number the next time I walked in of a, of a, uh, a potential investor who turned out to be, you know, a very good connection, important person in this process. Uh, then sometime later, I walked in there with a bunch of pictures that had, were given to me by the Tellerian family, uh, a photo album of their personal pictures. And I'm like, I have no idea who these people are. How will I ever find out who these other people are in these pictures with Sogamon Tellerian? And I was saying that to Arno and within 30 seconds of saying that, an old newspaper, an old Armenian newspaper guy walks in, a guy in his eighties and Arno looks up and he goes, you know, you just asked, how will you ever find somebody who can tell you who these people are? Ask this guy. Sure enough, I walk up to that guy. I start opening up this, this photo album. He's like, oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, that's so-and-so. Literally, within 30 seconds of having that, that thought, how will I ever know? So there's, if you ask Arno, and maybe I can get him on here and interview him, but uh, some 
crazy significant events have happened in that bookstore. And so I'm still in denial. I, I'm, a, you know, I'm kind of in denial that he's not going to be there. We'll see what happens. But uh, I got his permission to, to go ahead and put the videos, uh, the clips of him up. So this, I didn't go behind his back. I said, I'm putting it on the podcast. He goes, okay. So Abriel Bookstore is moving. I don't know. We'll see. I want to, I want it to stay there, but that's not up to me. All right. Uh, I want to move on to the next topic. Uh, I have a few points of clarification from last week, Armin. Uh, I don't know if you watched it and had any thoughts like misstatements or things that need to be clarified, but I have two things that I want to clarify. Uh, number one, where was Sogamon Talerian during the genocide? So I, as I watched last week's episode, I realized there, there could be some confusion when Armin was explaining where Solomon actually was during the genocide. He was saying, well, he was on the Russian front. He wasn't in the Ottoman Empire with his family, so he couldn't possibly see them massacred. He wasn't a part of the de deportations because he was on the Russian side in the volunteer regiments, the Armenian volunteer regiments, which is true. But then when I said he wasn't there, I said, no, he was in Serbia. Well, both are true. So, so Sogomon left the Ottoman Empire before the war because he was about to turn 18. His mother said, you got to go and go be with your father and brothers in Serbia. So his, his father and brothers had a shop, a, a store in Serbia, and Sogomon was going there. He, his ultimate goal was to go to Berlin to be a student, an engineering student. That's that's those were his aspirations, his ambitions. So his mother said, "The best chance for you to to pursue that is to go be with your father and your older brothers." So he was in Serbia. While he was in Serbia, World War One started, and then he went to the Russian front to join the volunteers. So that point of clarification. Uh, I have another thing I want to clarify. But do you have anything to add to that, Armin? Actually, nothing related to history. But I caught myself. Uh in the, the parts where we were talking about the films, like Saving Private Ryan and Hacksaw Ridge, and I felt like there were some things I could have mentioned, but maybe we can leave that till later, or it wasn't having no, anything to do with Clarify it now. Any, but... any, I have a, something that's unrelated to history as well, so whatever your clarifications are, offer them now. This is your chance. No, I mean, the only thing that I was thinking about was uh, how not only these films were are very well made the production values are so great but they also the stories that they tell center the, the human dilemma uh so also again in saving private ryan you have uh eight soldiers who are going out to rescue one paratrooper in order to have him return back to his mother and of course there's the moral and ethical dilemmas involved in that and in hacksaw ridge it's also the main character who is a conscientious objector and how he cannot pick up a firearm and fire it and how the culture in the army uh, is so well portrayed in that film where you are at the very least the military higher ups are questioning his his courage and his uh, you know they're just uh, uh you know uh, you know, they're, the way that they're casting him as if he's a, a coward you know, is so unfair when you see uh, when you see that. And then in the second half of the film, once it transfers to the Pacific front, you see how empty those words were, or how empty those kinds of accusations were. And it proves to be one of the most courageous people that you know, one will probably come across in stories about the Second World War. Yeah. Spoiler alert, yeah. he does grab a gun. <laughs> yeah he doesn't fire it though right that's right that's it's, it's i think that was a nice i don't know if that's historically accurate maybe it is but i think it was a nice a uh, nice touch that they uh, if it's not historically accurate i think that was a nice touch to put in where he resisted even touching a gun for so long and then a moment comes where it actually results in saving someone's life even though he doesn't fire it he needs to use it anyway so i won't spoil it all but um so the other point of clarification that I wanted to make was regarding comments on the YouTube 
uh, channel on the, uh, the videos. So I'm not sure about this YouTube thing and the mechanics behind the scenes. You have an option to where you can either allow all comments, you can hold all comments, you can make no comments, or you can hold comments for review. And my understanding was holding comments for review, which is what I've selected for all videos, means that I would have to approve the comments to be viewed. Apparently that's not the case because that, that thumbs down comment we got from last week was viewed by someone else and commented on by someone else. So clearly I was wrong that anybody can see comments. And so you can go to that particular video and see that it now has four comments and uh, most of them are negative. <laughs> and one of them is I think in <laughs> Turkish. Uh, I don't know if you went to that. Did you see the other comments on that video? Yeah, I think I saw uh, like just a very brief chain of uh, responses to our video. And if you're right, I mean, it is in Turkish, but the, they're not saying too many nice things about us. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can translate it for me and send it maybe. <laughs> I, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think we're up to uh, three or four thumbs down now. So uh, we're, we're, we're going in the wrong direction on that video or the right direction, depending on how you see it. Well, maybe we got the history wrong. You should uh, listen a little bit more to yeah, our viewers. Yeah, maybe, maybe our maybe our historians are wrong, and and these you know viewers have some information that we don't have access to. So we're open to being wrong. I mean, that's the point, right? You, you got to go to it open minded. I mean, we've done extensive research, and you know, interviewed a lot of people, and you know, there's a you know almost an overwhelming amount of documentation. But hey, we could be wrong. We're all human after all. <laughs> all right. Uh, we've been doing a countdown uh, on this podcast, and I I want to add something to that countdown. So I think after a few episodes, you, you probably have it clear, Armin, what the countdown is. What What is the countdown? So one is to the actual anniversary of the assassination, and the other one is for his acquittal. Got it. That's exactly correct. So a uh, hundred year, you know, the centennial, the big round number is coming up. We're within, we're within a year of two extremely important moments in history that most people don't even know about. One of them being the assassination of the former Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire. It's like taking out Hitler. It's like taking out the leader of a nation. And that happened a hundred years ago, coming on March 15th. Uh, and then the other one is the acquittal of that assassin and, and the point of this whole podcast. The Sogolman Talirian uh, trial and acquittal was less than a year ago. So we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of those two events. And I've we've been doing a week countdown. So the weekly countdown and how many weeks until those events. What I did notice is that uh, as we record this podcast, uh, uh, almost, you know, four to five days go by before I'm actually able to post it, sometimes even a week. And so we're about a week off in that countdown. So in the previous episode, if you watched it, it was 33 weeks until the 100 year anniversary of the assassination of Talat Pasha and 44 weeks until the 100 year anniversary of the trial and acquittal of Sogamon Talirian. Well, I'm going to modify that. So I'm going to say 31 weeks and 42 weeks. I'm going to skip over 32 and 43 because I want to be accurate. When this video gets posted, it'll probably be next week. So it'll be a week closer. So 31 weeks from this week is the 100 year anniversary of the assassination of Talat Pasha. And 42 weeks from this week is 100 year, 100 year anniversary of the trial. Um, but I want to add something to this countdown. And I want you to expound on what do you think Sogomon Talirian was doing 100 years ago from right now? Where was he? What was he doing? I'm putting you on the spot, Armin. Well, I mean, it's not too hard to remember. This was, I think, when he was in Paris, right? I mean, there's some discrepancy on when exactly he sits on the boat to come to the United States. It was either in August or October, which is a pretty big discrepancy, but he was at least in the beginning of August in, in Paris, and he was trying to 
scrape by a living and um, you know I think by that point he had already lost all hope of finding Talat. Now I remember when we were researching this discrepancy do you remember the sources why uh, which source says which I know his memoir says one and then another source was it the Ellis Island or yeah, so I think it was just principally two sources. So one was the memoir, which I think sometimes we can uh, forgive or excuse if he got certain dates wrong, but overall it's fairly accurate. But a much more concrete source that we can refer to as a, an archival document is the Ellis Island entry uh, form. So it actually has his name and the ship that he was on and some other some other relevant details, but that one I think was from October 1920. So that one's a little bit more accurate, I think, than perhaps his memoir. But, you know, this is the fun thing about uh, doing history. You have two sources and you have to judge the, the quality and the value and which one is closer to the truth. And again, truth in quotation marks. Right. So we know in August he was in Paris. Uh, but depending on which source is more accurate, it was either sometime in August or it was in October that he traveled to the United States. Um, and man, I want to go into more detail on that, but I don't want, and it's a spoiler alert, but, uh, but that's, so 100 years ago, he was sitting in Paris. Maybe I will talk a little bit about that. Do you know why he was in Paris? Do you remember why he was in Paris? So in 1920 in Paris, their allies were just about wrapping up the, the peace negotiations with the defeated central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And for the allies, Germany and Austria, Hungary, and foremost Germany took precedence over the peace, took precedence in the peace negotiations. So it took about six months until they hashed out the Treaty of Versailles in June of 1919. And then over the next year or so, the, the Allies just kind of left the, the peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire on the back burner. And so while treaties were concluded with Austria-Hungary and Bulgaria, the one that was concluded with the Ottomans did not was not signed until really uh, about... 100 years ago, the Treaty of Versailles, it's funny, the, the anniversary for that is also creeping up. And so in order to get the best form of best kind of deal for the Armenians, there were two delegations, one that had already established itself in Paris before the war, and the other that had been sent by this new Republic of Armenia that had been established in May of 1918. And, you know, I think it was, it was like 40 delegates. And so they were at constant loggerheads with one another because they weren't always speaking with one voice and Tellerian uh, decided to travel to Paris because he thought that maybe the delegation would be in a position to help him put him on the, the track of Talat and trying to uh, you know set him on the course to carrying out vengeance right um, real quick do you remember the date of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles I think it was August 10th, so it's next Monday. All right, well, 1920. I will be posting this. Maybe maybe this is August 10th when this gets posted. Um, <laughs> what do you know, 100 years ago, the 100-year anniversary? And and that kind of lends credence to the, the notion that I've mentioned before that Sogumen was like the Forrest Gump of the Armenian genocide. Like he was at all, he was at all these significant locations. He was even in Paris during the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, and he was there because he was he was on... he was in Istanbul when the Versailles Treaty was signed. Wait, you just said the Treaty of Versailles, the one hundred year anniversary is coming up. Versailles one hundred year anniversary was last year, so nineteen nineteen, uh, two thousand nineteen. So got it. This okay. is the Treaty of Sèvres, or yeah, this is the actual peace treaty that was signed between the Allies and the Ottomans, not the the Germans and the Allies. All right. We're going to edit that out, maybe. I don't know. Maybe we won't edit it out. Maybe maybe this is this is what this podcast is about, the historian correcting me and mi my mishearing. But 
Point of clarification, when was the Treaty of Versailles signed? What was the centennial? June 28th, 1919 was when it was signed and the centennial was last year. All right, so right on the heels of that, uh, there's still delegations in Paris and he's following the, the Armenian uh, delegation, the, the diplomats, the leaders of uh, the, the Armenian populace. Uh, I believe Armenia was declared their independence. What's yeah. the... Uh, Armenia declared, the first Armenian Republic uh, declared its independence in on May 28th, 1918. So in the midst of the First World War. Got it. They, they declared independence and so they were doing what they could to represent themselves. They sent a delegation to, to Paris and Solomon at that time was on a mission. He was, he was looking, he was looking for Talat and he had one goal and he, it was unshakable an unshakable goal. And he came to a dead end. We're not going to go into all the details maybe later, but he came in, came to a dead end in Istanbul. And so he knows that the Armenian delegation is in Paris. So he goes to Paris thinking that he's going to get some kind of connection, some kind of contact to help him find Talat because he realized that he didn't have the resources and he needed help. So, uh, so 100 years ago today, he was sitting in a small studio rented apartment, just wondering, wondering if he could ever, he, he had great doubts about whether he would succeed or not. And this was kind of the low point for him. Um, all right. That's our countdown. Last thing. So Armin started a new segment, a new a new segment in our podcast last week, and we don't know what it's called, but we know what it's about. So did you, I gave Armin the assignment to think of a, a name for our, our new segment. Did you come up with anything yet, Armin? Well, I mean, I, I honestly thought Hollywood and history is a pretty good one since we are talking about films and uh, how they're represented accurately or portrayed. Uh, so I thought that was a good one to, just to go in, or what we have right now. Hollywood and history, the sub, the subsection of the podcast, Hollywood and history. Uh, okay. We'll think about it. I'll, we'll come up with something, but we have this segment and I, I think we should do it maybe every week, come up with a movie to talk about on the podcast. Since we're talking about, this is really behind the scenes. This whole podcast is a behind the scenes of the development of a movie. You know, we intend for this to be a film. There's a screenplay written. There's producers, you know, there's producers reading it, et cetera. And so this, podcast itself, aside from documenting our friendship and our journey through archives and learning history, it's a behind the scenes of the development of a story. But let's talk about other movies. And if I have a movie that I picked out that I want to talk about, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Armin, not only because you're a historian and focused in on precisely the time period and the, the region of the world and the events that I needed. I needed somebody who was, you know, an expert in these, in these subjects. Not only is our friendship perfect because of that, but you love, you're a movie lover. And so there's, we don't just talk about history. We enjoy, we've gone to some films together and we enjoy talking about movies. So I think that's uh, I think that was a good idea for you to bring up to, you know, we need to talk about that on this podcast. And so what movie, I emailed you the name of it. What movie did I mention I wanted to talk about? Uh, it wasn't a movie, but the, the documentary, They Shall Not Be Forgotten. A documentary is a movie, Armin. Oh, I mean, sorry. I don't work in the industry, so I don't, still trying to learn all the vocabulary. Okay, Fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're just, you're a, you're a, a, a movie snob. It has to be a narrative. And, otherwise, it's not a movie. It's just history. <laughs> uh, so did you see this movie? Yeah, I was actually in D.C. when it came out. And I think that was in January or February of 2019. I went and watched it in the theater here. Oh, so you did see it. Yeah, no, definitely. It was uh, 
something I was kind of counting down to when I first heard about it as well. Great. Well, I, I was in, I was at Sundance when it came out at Sundance, but unfortunately, uh, I wait, I think it was at Sundance. Maybe I'm thinking of, an, of another movie. I, maybe it wasn't at Sundance. I'll have to look it up. Um, but I was looking forward to it coming out. And so I went, those of you who haven't seen it, can you do a, a quick explanation of what this, it's not like any other documentary. It's a, it's a, it's a very unique uh, type of film. I don't even know if you really could categorize it as a documentary. It's something different. Explain, Armin. Huh. Explain, Armin. <laughs> uh, right. So Peter Jackson, who, of course, is most famous for making the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy and all the other sequels that came out after that, made this, well, call, you know, just for the sake of an argument, we'll call it a, a documentary, basically went to the Imperial War Museum archives in London and trawled through all these audio recordings of British, primarily British and Commonwealth troops who served during the First World War and recounted their experiences from beginning from their recruitment to their uh, disembarking for France and Belgium to serve on the Western Front and to the combat and finally to, uh, you know, over the next, the course of the next four years until their, uh, until the, the signing of the armistice in November 1918 and the their new demobilization. And I think it's about an hour and a half long. So it's one hour of testimonies that you hear and which are playing in the background while you're seeing footage of the of the soldiers that was recorded during the fighting. And what is more, it's colorized. And what is more, is there's this audio that you also hear. So if you, for example, see these tanks which are rolling on to the field in somewhere in Belgium or in France, you also hear these sounds that have been recreated. Or if you hear like the artillery that's being fired, the you know, Peter Jackson, I remember seeing in the, the last half hour of the documentary, somehow had like artillery lying around in his backyard. And, you know, he brought in an army crew to fire it and use the the audio recording and superimpose it into the into the, the documentary. So it's really a technological masterpiece. And I think that's why so many people were so excited when it came out. But interestingly enough, it also kicked up a a little bit of dust and controversy among historians in terms of which soldiers were being portrayed. Um, you know, again, it's just mainly British and Commonwealth troops. What about, say, the French or, or the Germans or even non-combatants from other parts of the uh, the world? Chinese laborers who were brought in to work on the trenches in the uh, in, on the Western Front, or let's say the experience of Ottoman troops, which is much more germane to our story but uh, it's so interesting to see that it created that much kind of controversy and uh, especially when at least with uh, in history you know circles among scholars so that's just a very brief synopsis of the film right so now it's the reason it's not like a regular documentary is because even though there's the commentary by Peter Jackson, that's not actually a part of the documentary. That's tagged on at the end. It's like post credits or maybe it's during the credits. But there's this short kind of behind the scenes of the documentary that, at least in the theatrical release, uh, was Peter Jackson explaining the process, explaining how the film was made. And to that particular point where people say, well, why didn't, why didn't this film cover these other, uh, other nations or other war fronts or other, other, why didn't, why didn't he, you know, spend any time on these other aspects of the war? And he said, because there's, there was such a, well, first of all, he was conscripted by the British 
museum or war museum or something. And they so they specifically commissioned it's the this Imperial War Museum. The Imperial War Museum. They they specifically commissioned him. They said, We have all this footage, do with it whatever you want, make something. He goes, Okay. And there was so much of it from so many battlefronts, from so many uh you know I mean there's a lot of footage from the war and all he has is an hour and a half. And so to choose a compelling narrative or or to start had basically he started from scratch he just started pouring through hours and hours of footage and trying to decide what he was going to focus on and so he decided to focus very specifically on one specific or one particular uh uh p- locale or one one series like he d- he didn't do any of the uh, you know uh aerial bombardments or didn't do any of the naval assaults or anything like that so it was ground forces in this one particular conflict and the way the movie unfolds let me just explain to you if you haven't seen it in 1917 18 19 15 16 17 18 uh when this footage is from they were silent films there's no audio there's no sound and the tech uh camera technology had not settled on a frame rate Right today, all of your feature films are 24 frames per second. Uh, some footage, some formats are 30 frames per second. They're 60 frames per second, but the film format is typically 24 frames per second because that's you know the, the human eye perceives pictures at a certain rate, and that that has a certain effect when you watch it. 24 pictures per second. Well, back then the cameras were hand cranked. And so that's why when you watch footage from that era, the 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 motion of the people is is inconsistent. It's kind of sometimes it feels it looks like they're moving fast. Sometimes they they slow down a little bit. And so what they did is they invented a technology to smooth out and and determine what uh, how this film should be spread out. And so they would insert frames if it was fi- if it was shot at 15 frame- frames per second, so going a little slower than it normally would, or if it was sh- going faster. They they developed a technology to smooth it out and a- and add. Uh, the frames, and then they colorized it, and then they got lip readers to to read the the lips of anybody who was on camera that was talking, and then they got voiceover actors to to do the the lines, and then they got sound design to do all the artillery and 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 the marching and and so, but in the film, those different steps unfold gradually. So you start with the original footage; it's black and white. And then it starts to smooth out. And it's like, oh, this is kind of starting to feel like normal, you know, normal film. And then, oh, now it's in color. And now, wow, it looks like a real place. And, oh, these guys are looking at the camera and they're talking and I can hear them. And you get sucked in. And it's just, it's an it's an experience to go and watch this movie. The way technologies advance to where it doesn't look like an old movie. It looks like, you know, uh, it looks like modern film you know, a modern movie. Like these could be actors cast in this. And it, it was very, very impressive and very effective. Uh, in particular, there's one scene where there's a a captain reading an order or something. He has a, a, a piece of paper in his hand and he's reading it to the troops standing around. And, and they, they were trying to read this guy's lips, but he would like turn away. And so they couldn't, so they would just get pieces of it. And then they went and found the actual order. They found, they, they, the researchers, the historians, whoever found what this location was, who it was, and what, uh, what was being said. And so it was like, uh, for me, because I had already been working on this project, to see a World War I era uh, document documentary about the time period that my guy was fighting. He was in the, in the war and he was fighting. And look, I'm going to just show you right now, we have a bunch of footage. We have tons of footage from from that era, but we have footage from the Russian front. These are these films. These this footage you're watching right now. This is from uh, Russian archives. And uh, in addition to doing a, a narrative about Sogum and Talirian, you know, an epic historical narrative, you know, big budget feature film, you know, with romance and horror and war and espionage and a courtroom drama. In addition to that story, we've got 
a bunch of documentary footage and we could use some of the techniques that Peter Jackson used in his film to bring to life the Russian front, the, that side of the, of the front. So, you know, watching this movie is, is research to me. It's like, oh, you know, this is being done. And in addition, in addition to uh, uh, a movie we mentioned last week, 1917, that film, when I found out that film was coming out and that it was, just, you know, it was well done and it was critically acclaimed, I think it won a couple of Academy Awards for effects and stuff. So that 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 era is is now on the mind of Hollywood and people in Hollywood is is confirmation and encouragement to me that we're on the right track, that this that we're, we're doing something that will be embraced, uh, not just by film goers, but by the industry. Any thoughts, any yeah, comments? I, yeah, I was just going to say with regards to that one scene that you're talking about from the they shall not be forgotten with the the captain who's reading the orders is I just found it so mind blowing to think that they were able to go into the archives and find the actual orders and then somehow match the, the lip, you know, the lip readers were able to match that order to, uh, you know, to that particular officer and then just have that scene recreated. Uh, you know, it's just amazing to see the kind of like technology they were able to bring to bear to bring that, um, you know, to bring that era to life or to a 21st century audience. Yeah. And, you know, that documentary was very expensive. Like that Peter Jackson documentary is one of the most expensive documentaries ever made. And uh, I'm glad he did it because, you know, after he, one person does it, it gets cheaper afterwards. <laughs> you know, they, they refine <laughs> the technology. And so uh, by the time we get, I mean, I have it budgeted. I, I had a guy do a budget for our documentary. And, and I said, you know, throw the money in that whatever it would cost now, but I know the price has come down. So I have to have him revisit that budget. All right, Armin. Uh, I think we got enough for this episode. Do you have any, any closing words? Uh, not really, but I, I, am, I have to say I am enjoying this format. It's kind of like splitting half the time for, on history, in the history section, and then the other half talking about films, which, as you said, I really enjoy watching and yapping about, as you, as you obviously know. <laughs> Well, I'm enjoying it as well, and uh, you look good on camera, so, you know, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> right. Well, you look good, too, so Ooh. I hope you won't feel bad that uh, you're just, you're the only one who's making the compliment. Uh, you're, you're upstaging me, Armin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Until next week, everyone. Bye. This footage you're watching right now is footage that we took in a film archive in Tbilisi, Georgia. So these, these cans of film uh, date, I think the earliest film footage they have in this archive is from 1912. And we located some footage from the city of Tbilisi between the years of 1914 and 1917, which would cover the time when Sogomon Talirian was actually in Tbilisi, so who knows, maybe he's on film somewhere. <laughs>